Welcome to the uh, iSchool at University of Maryland's uh, GEM, Game Entertainment and Media Analytics Industry Speaker Series. Uh, today we've got our uh, 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 sequel expert, Aaron Barnett from Captain TV, uh, who's going to speak about sharpening your sequel skills for game analytics. Uh, and uh, Aaron, would you uh, please, could you introduce yourself? And then uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand it off to you to do the sharing. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks, David. Um, my name is Aaron Barnett and I uh, lead engineering currently for Captain TV. We make games that streamers play uh, alongside with their their audience and with their community. Um, spent a number of years in in game development and a lot of years in in data driven uh, applications and startups. Spent a lot of time in data. Um, I don't let's see. I need to share my screen. Boop, boop, like you said. There we go. Um, I'm not sure I consider myself an SQL expert, but I'm pretty battle hardened with it. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to share the story. This is a Chinese philosopher named Zhengzi. Uh, the story is called the Dexterous Butcher, and it's about a um, it's about a cook who's observed as having an extremely high level of of mastery. His his work is observed and and compared with with dancing. Um, he's described as as being spirit led in moving his his knife through the ox and it's really just a story uh, about mastery in, in general, and you know what it means to develop your intuition and, and what that what that experience is like. Um, so there's there's this one segment um, that I, uh, drew me to the story when I was thinking about you know what I look for in in peers who work in SQL. Um, it is a uh, good cook changes his knife once a year because he cuts. A mediocre cook changes his knife once a month because he hacks. And I've thought about this in a lot of different things that I do. Um, a lot of times if you're trying to force something, you're probably doing it the wrong way. And when you find the elegant solution through, you, you, you're on a better path, a path that we enjoy and, and, and has good outcomes. Um, so the two things I want to draw out of this is, is efficiency is, is a key, also in SQL, in addition to cutting oxes. Um, but also this story talks a little bit about indirectly about self-sufficiency. Um, the story is about a cook and he's cutting his own ox. Um, and that probably makes it easy for nothing to get in the way of his, and the, the end goal is probably to, to make some meal. Um, but this is, this is a heavy lifting part of the journey that, that he is masterful in. All right, so I got in, involved in this program and, and the question was posed to me, um, you're, you're seeing data analysts come out of grad school. Um, what's, what's the delta between how their training has set them up and, and what you expect from them? And, and we had talked about this a lot um, with a previous company and, and it really boiled down to, to two things. It's, it's kind of about fundamentals, honestly. I'm meeting a lot of people who are extremely intelligent and talented. Um, they're good analysts. Um, a lot of people who are in this area gather some level of, of machine learning or, or data science uh, algorithmic use, and, and that's all great, you know, and, and, and you want to come in and you want to use those things. Um, but but the, the fundamentals make it really difficult to, to take this person and, and put them into our organization. A lot of time game teams are, are very fast and light, and people need to play a lot of roles. And, and so I want to talk a little bit about efficiency. Um, and one one thing I hear a lot is is that people feel like they they are an SQL expert. The, the syntax is extremely simple, and and it's if you're a smart person, you can digest the entire scope of what you can do with SQL very quickly. It's very easy, um, but until you've really put it to use and and leveraged it and and moved large things, uh, I I don't I don't think that you've really kind of gotten a sense for what SQL is and and how to use it well. Um, and the other is is self sufficiency, and and this is kind of back to you know I'm very often in small aggressive companies or, or game teams or studios, and um, you need to play a lot of roles, and and so sometimes I, I meet people who are very talented analysts, and and you know if they work in very large companies, there will be a data engineering team that will bring them spreadsheets that they request, and then they can do analysis on that, and that's cool, um, but that's that's not really the analyst that that I tend to be looking for. Um, I'm tending to look for an analyst that can get their hands dirty in things like AWS services, 
Um, starting up a database is not something that you need an operations person for anymore. Anyone, anyone who knows how to use the, the web can figure out how to start up a database and give people access to it. And, and so these are the kind of people that are really useful. Um, you know, I want to trust you to do a good analysis, but if we need to do a lot of work to, to help you get there, then, then it's more costly. Um, and so focusing in on efficiency, just sort of the why. Uh, compute time is very expensive. Storage is, is very cheap right now. Compute time is very expensive. Um, long queries cost more and they, and they take longer. The take longer is, is kind of the value to you. I feel like when I am trying to discover um, information or knowledge, having to stop for huge amounts of time um, just just to run a step of of your your data transformation, it, it can really take your mind out of of what you're doing. And sometimes it's just going to take a long time. But we we want our time back. We don't want to be waiting. We want to be doing analysis. Um, so jumping in, this is my favorite interview question. This was number six uh, at a previous studio. And when I would get this back from candidates, I would skip immediately to number six to see if I even wanted to read the rest of the test. Uh, and most of the time it was illegible. Um, a large amount of the time I would see this over on the right. Um, and if I see this, then I'm like, <sighs> but if the rest of your test looks good, then, then, then I'll ask you in a phone screen if you can make this better. This is correct. Um, and, and to go through the question, there's, there's a table in the middle on the left. This is a, a time series uh, spend table for a game. So user number one upgraded as Archer on the 14th to level one. Time series information is usually what we're dealing with. Um, and very often we want to transform that time series data into more of, of an, an, ent an entity model. And so if you look at the output on the bottom, now as an analyst, after I've done this transformation, um, I can look user at a time and I can start to look for behaviors um, like well, how much time did it take between steps or, or, you know, how much did you spend on the journey? Who knows? But I'm going to start looking at things, you know, by user. And so this idea of, of pivoting data is, is very important. Again, on the right, that's correct. Here's why I don't like it. Um, it. It takes multiple passes through the data. This one actually has four. Sometimes people try to do this with three passes and unions. Um, either way, it's, it's unnecessarily lengthy. And it's not wrong. Um, if you're in a small database, you're probably not even hurting anybody and you probably won't even notice the, the, uh, the difference. Uh, I forgot to mention my caveat at the bottom. I'm saying there's, there's 500 billion records. And, and that's, where, that's where this will really start to break down. Um, joins are expensive. And, and sometimes it's hard to understand where it's good and where it's bad, joining against small dimension tables or just small reduced data sets is much better. Uh, but the join is, is one of the most expensive things that can be done. Uh, I'm gonna come back to that question in a minute. Um, okay, so the other thing about join is, you know, you've got a lot of data sets in flight right here. You've got three different, potentially very large data sets. They're probably not 500 billion records, but they're probably millions. And, and you're going to try to coalesce these all in, in memory. And this is, this is the thing that brings SQL really to its knees. It's the scaling weakness. Um, and so we, we, tried, we try not to beat up databases by doing that so much. At the bottom is sort of an intermediate form. Um, what, to visualize what's going on, it's making three lists of, of users and records. And then it's going to bring those, those together in the end. Not wrong, not ideal. Uh, this is what I would consider an ideal, um, and is you know when I when I check the 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 test and I skip to, to question six, I I look and as soon as I see max case, I'm like thank you. Um, the intermediate form is a little different. That's down at the bottom. I won't spend a lot of time there, but you're essentially going through one time. I'll jump to the next slide. We're going through this one time, and we're collecting up what we need. Um, that. You don't see that difference in a, in a small database, but when we're at 500 billion, multiple laps through is bad. That join is even worse, that join at the end in terms of impact on the time. So with this, we're going through one time. We're doing, we're doing one essentially, essentially a one grouping and no joins. Uh, this is incredibly fast. I, I recently helped someone reduce time 
was a similar form to this. We were in a position where a query could run for a month of time, but couldn't run for a lifetime anymore. There was no way the database would time out. We got it down to lifetime in like 45 seconds. It was really huge. And I, I, don't, think, I don't remember how big that was. It was big. Um, I'm going to save this, this question for a little later. Um, so just to kind of reduce this to tactics, um, and this is to kind of summarize what we just talked about. If you don't go through something twice, you know, if I go down to the basement to, to get paper towels, I should probably grab the pasta as well, instead of coming back down in a minute. We, you know, if there's some obvious benefit to not repeating yourself and, and dry, don't repeat yourself as a, it's a programmer, um, idiom that we use a lot. Um, and on top of that, I think, you know, when you have a solution that's correct, I think it's important to ask yourself, like, like, can you do this better? Um, and and that, that question will be pushed on you in large databases because it will time out. You'll wait a, a large amount of minutes and then find out that it's never going to complete and you'll have lost all this time. Um, so you're, you're better off right away to, to see if you can do better. You should be, when you have a query, especially as you're learning, uh, running explain on your query is, is a really interesting way to start to think about what is this query going to do? Where is it going to spend its time? And, and as, you, as you change your tactics around and try to find faster and better ways, uh, explain is, is probably your best tool for figuring out if you're on the right track. Um, understanding the cost of joins, you know, this is kind of tricky. I think you can really get pretty far with just trying to avoid uh, joining large record sets together. Re if you have to join them, you have to join them. Um, reduce them first, and, and that will help you a lot. Uh, and the, this idea of layering is is really important in performance, and I didn't cover this with, with the last topic, um, but I'm going to repeat this, this concept of, of layering uh, over and over kind of through the rest of this. The idea of layering your data um, is, as a way of increasing performance and, and, and you know, is, is really important in the way I see uh, shaping up data pipelines. Um, you, very often with performance of queries, people are advised like use temporary tables. And essentially what you're doing, like I was mentioning with the other query, when a lot of joins come together, there's a lot of, of the query processing engine that needs to be engaged because you're gonna process that list and join as you go. Um, if you are able to, to get one of what would be potentially a subquery and put it in a temp table and flatten it, you're kind of going to reduce the memory footprint of what it's going to take to deal with it. A lot, a lot of what is being, being done to it is done. And I, I tend to call that like in a flattened state when it's in a table, um, as opposed to, you know, a lot of times we look at views that have a lot of complex query. And so when, when you know, as opposed to querying a table that's sort of baked, um, you know, doing a large query that figures out things as you go is more expensive. So you can kind of create islands of data as you move through an analysis um, instead of trying to get it all into one query. And this, this ends up being a lot more performant. We see that at another level with this idea of materialized views. What I do a lot if I want to kind of get a concept available in the database, like you know, even things like a list of cheaters, you know, that may be a complicated uh, thing to express, you know, who, who do we think is cheating? And I may have, you know, a lot of analysis or, or statistics behind it. And so we may have a view that's very expensive to run. I'd like to see and maybe join out, you know, who we think are cheaters or maybe even internal people. Um, what, I, what I like to do with that I like the view being there so we have the definition shared, but as we as we use it, we don't want to be running that over and over again. And so um, there is a materialized view in Redshift. I tend to use materializing as a general concept to just basically mean take a view and bake it into a fixed table. Running the view is expensive. It will give you the most current data, but taking the nightly snapshot or materialization of that view is much more performant. Um, and we're going to talk more about this as we go. Uh, one more note, uh, kind of on the performance and, and efficiency side, is I think it's really important to understand what's going on underneath the engine. Um, and so again, with the idea of the SQL, it's very simple. Um, you know, we we obviously select star from a table. You know, we we understand what that means. But as you look across different databases, it means something different in terms of how the engine is going to work. It, it may give you the same data on both engines, but it's going to run differently. And, and that can often inform how you write your queries. Um, MySQL, for instance, 
uses a, a file or a set of files to describe a table and, and not to describe it, but to, to hold all of its data. And it has those in some sequence and it has indexes for where those records all are. When you, when you find a record in MySQL or when MySQL finds a record, all of the, the row data is there. All of the columns are stored right next to each other. And so select star, like we, we know we should probably shouldn't do select star if we're trying to perform it. In MySQL, it's not actually that bad uh, in terms of seek time. It will, it will increase the amount of data that needs to be collected and pushed through. But in terms of seek time, it, it really, it doesn't change that much. Redshift is stored column at a time, which means it's got a set of files for every column in every table. And this is absolutely wonderful when you have billions of rows and, and a lot of columns, and you just want to grab two or three of them because it actually makes it possible. Getting the entire table with all of its records that, that would be exhausting for everyone, including the database. Um, but if we just need two columns and we need to kind of transform them together, turns out that's actually something we like to do a lot, um, then Redshift really shines right there. If you throw a select star on Redshift, you're going to do a lot of work you don't need to do. Well, Redshift is. You're going to do a lot of waiting. Snowflake is very different. Snowflake is probably the funnest large database right now. Um, it's a little less accessible. It has a high cost to, to entry. Um, but they have a, a really interesting approach and in, oh shoot, uh, they have an interesting approach in that they have this idea of micro partitions that instead of using indexes or sort keys, um, you use this idea of cluster keys. And so it's going to take groups of records and throw them together and put them out in the cloud on S3. And then its metadata will sort of be based on the indexes, what's the range of values in this cluster? And that allows the seek to go through and say, do I even need to look in this cluster? Is there anything in there I'm interested in? Uh, and, it, and it can kind of work cluster at a time. So, and, and I found this quote actually when I was making sure I actually knew what micro partitions were. Uh, they say this right on the Snowflake documentation, um, to best utilize Snowflake tables, particularly large tables, it's helpful to have an understanding of the physical structure behind the logical structure. So the SQL is going to be the same in all three of these databases, but your query is going to run differently. Um, the advice from me and apparently from Snowflake is, is that you get a grip of, of how things are working underneath. This is really going to inform you and guide your intuition about how to write queries. Um, I'm going to move over to the self-sufficiency side um, and, and just give you a little bit of a tour of, of kind of what we've been doing with data pipelines. Um, probably about six years ago, a lot of us in, 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 in data and in game data were getting a little frustrated with how, how rigorous um, data warehouses can be. There are a lot of work to set up and, and a lot of work to change. And especially in, in games and especially in the early life cycle of a game, and we, we may not know how we want to look at things. We may not understand how we want to model behavior yet. And so we, we kind of need a more dynamic environment. And so we kind of, some peers and I went on a mission to, to kind of take control of the data pipeline ourselves and figure out what it could mean to run all the way to the data warehouse, just doing that ourselves. We were in a position where publishers were supplying us with, with data pipelines and analytics solutions that were just, they were rigorous and they made it difficult to work. Um, so anyway, this is kind of where we, where we ended up. <laughs> and I actually was really excited to find, you know, as, as we you know, talk to other people in, in game analytics, a lot of people were sort of discovering this at the same time. We're, we're kind of now in a position where if you want to roll your own data pipeline front to back, uh, you can pretty much do that with one person. Um, and, and I'm gonna show you how we're doing that. And this is sort of still in progress for us at Captain TV. We're sort of moving to a more generalized analytics solution for multiple games, um, but we're keeping very open in terms of how that schema works. We're keeping very, very light and not trying to impose a lot of structure onto two games, um, not assuming how they're going to measure things. So real quick, you know, you're, you're an analyst, you're trying to be self-sufficient. You're like, hey, uh, guys, I'll help set up the, the database. I'll get Redshift going. The one ask you really need from the developers is you need to say, hey, I need you guys to post an event. To, it's an HTTP post, and I need it, need it to be JSON. And, and JSON is this little structure here. Give me an event name, give me a timestamp, and then give me any other data you want. Anything you think is relevant, just add it to this package, and I'll give you a URL. Done. Developers are out of it. You can take it from here. Um, this is 
one option. There, there are many, but um, it's fun to stay in the AWS. Uh, API Gateway is a way to provide a, a static URL that, that maps to an Amazon service, so you can set up a URL to start receiving these events. Kinesis is uh, essentially a way to batch up and receive uh, those events. Um, they're going to be coming in very fast because your game's very successful and you do a lot of tracking. Um, and it's going to batch those up how you like and drop them on S3. It can actually get it to a lot of places for you. Um, the most important place, though, is S3. Um, and, and that's listed next. This is really where we're going to be storing data. Um, Redshift or other databases can come up and down. They can load data from S3. They can they can drop the data that they have. Um, but S3 ends up being kind of the record of, of what we have and intend to keep having. Um, I like the term data lake. It's sort of formless. And I, don't, I don't know. It's a good term. Uh, so I'm going to jump in to like real quick. So we, we just went through here real quick. We can learn on Amazon documentation how to get from HTTP to S3. That's not a big deal. Um, once we get over into Redshift, this is a pattern I like to use. Um, one, of the, one of the frustrations that I, I've had with the more rigorous data warehouses uh, is the idea that we want to track a new field on an event that we currently track, right? So we need to get in touch with the database team at the publisher and say, can you add a column to Redshift? Because if you don't, um, then it's going to start failing the imports. And, and that's just sort of presuming too much structure, especially for, like I said, we want to be very fast and light. Um, this, is, this is a structure where I have an incoming table. All events come into this end, incoming table. Everything that, you know, from this previous Kinesis uh, firehose pipe is going to go into this one incoming table. And this data type super will accept JSON. And you can actually query in, into JSON. Um, in this one field. And then I like to throw a load time on there because we've asked them to provide us with an app timestamp, but we're also going to add when, when we process that data. That process time is not as useful for analysis because it's batched, um, but it's good for debugging. So here we've jammed everything into one table. So this is really great from the perspective of, hey, the game team wants to add something new. Um, go ahead, just do it. And you know, we, we won't see it until we know to pull it out of this in incoming table. Um, but this keeps us super flexible in terms of receiving any data we want to receive, and then we'll sort it out when we get going. Uh, this is sort of the command if you're running it from the Redshift side, uh, how, that, how that works. Um, but we're not going to go super into that. Uh, let's move on. OK, so I've got this incoming table with everything in it. And the first thing I want to do is start unpacking it. Up, up top is this query syntax, this data.event and data.app timestamp. This is using you know, SQL syntax to drill down into a JSON blob and assign type, type information. Essentially, I'm going to start unpacking the events um, into views. And so this is, this is the, the view, like I mentioned this earlier with views and tables, like if I make a view over something, this is actually useful. Uh, you know, if, if I want to see what's going on, I can query this event view um, and it will give me very current information. And as long as I'm, I'm sorting by time, I probably won't get in big trouble performance wise. But this is not where I want to do all, all my analysis. Um, this, this drilling into JSON is a little bit expensive. Sorting through every event, finding your types, expensive. Um, and so what we like to do is on a, a nightly basis, create um, materializations, again, general term, um, in, into the event table. So whatever event one, one is, if it's open chest, um, you know, you could go to the open chest view and you could see what's going on live. Um, but if you're going to be doing things like counting things over the last month or the last year or lifetime, then we want to go to the table that we are materializing nightly. This pattern repeats over and, and over again. And this goes back to what I was saying about, about temp tables and, and materialized views. Um, with this idea of all these blue views, you, you could chain those all together. You could, you could make your daily user view work over top of your events that's going right into the incoming table. And views will, will very quietly run subqueries, and, and you'll do the entire analysis and the unpacking all in one big step. And that, that would be very expensive and slow. Um, so we're nightly. We're dropping all of our events into a table where we can start to gather up our next level models. And, and so the interview question I showed you earlier was, was essentially um, the beginnings of, of this kind of thing, moving from an event structure 
to an orientation around an entity, like in this case, it would be the user. So what do they do today? How much do they spend? Um, how, how many levels did they improve? Did they change their affiliation? Mm -mm. Um, that, that starts as a view, that daily user, and then again, materialize at night. So every night we're moving things from, from the blue lane uh, to, to the green lane. Even in terms of the deeper analysis, like if we're going to build a decision tree, we might wanna do an analysis that derives what, what those feature nodes are. Cool, we can make a view for that, um, but then we can bake that again. So then when we're doing our analysis based on, you know, what are our best decision nodes, we're only working with that green table with no dependencies all the way to the left. Um, I'm gonna take this question from Turk. Um, in terms of being, do I recommend AWS or, or Google Cloud Platform? Um, I would recommend both. Uh, I have kind of flipped back and forth just to be versatile. Um, it really kind of helps you understand one to have seen the other. I think in general, Amazon is probably easier to wade into um, if you're just getting started or haven't done either one. Amazon's very accessible, has a lot of free tier stuff. Um, I'm not really sure what Google is doing with free tiers, but but either one will provide you all of these services. BigQuery is is a different style database than than Redshift, but is also for for very big data sets. Um, so maybe start with Amazon just because you'll have a lot of community data. But it, Google's really catching up, and it's it's a tremendous service as well. M my answer would would be both. Uh, let's see if I want this other question before we move on. Where are we at? Um, SQL from another industry. I, I think for for what we're talking about, the the relevant SQL experience is about the size of data that you've used. And so I've I've interviewed I've interviewed analysts to become da data analysts, and that's what I want to know. Like, what's a big database? You know, how, how many billions of rows ha have you been working with? Um, and from that, I think. I think it's easy to, to bring a lot of that experience over. Um, in general, you, you're going to be driven, the, the questions you're going to be um, answering are going to be driven by a product man manager who's trying to discover um, behaviors in the game and, and kind of tune the game to, to line up with behaviors. And so if you can do that in any industry, I, I think it maps over well. I'm gonna knock that one out. Come back to that other question. Um, let's see. Kind of come to a close here, and then and then roll through questions. Um, okay. So so where do you, where do you go from here? You 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 don't want to be the uh, the mediocre cook. You you want people to compare your work to dancing. So what do you do? Um, I think most importantly is is play. And, and I mentioned S3 is a great place to put data. There's a tremendous amount of data out there. Um, one that's fun that recently came out, uh, leaked data is, is really great. Um, there was a Twitch leak that it was a largely, mostly a, a code leak, but there was, there was payout data to streamers. And, and the information in that data has kind of become common speaking knowledge. People, uh, I've seen streamers refer to what, what number they are in terms of, of you know, highest paid. Um, and so it's, it's interesting, interesting data to see, but when you see data like that, you should grab it and you should put it in your S3 bucket. It, it's pretty cheap to store stuff in S3. You know, maybe you want to reduce it before you stick it up there. Well, always watch your cost with cloud stuff. Um, you, you can get out of control. Um, but storage is pretty cheap. You should be okay. Find data, throw it in S3 and, and start to hoard it. And then you can start the exercise of like, well, I want to try out BigQuery, or I want to I want to try out Redshift. You know, what's the big deal with Redshift? What does it feel like? You can spin up Redshift, and for like you know probably less than twenty bucks a weekend, you can have a Redshift instance, and you, you can pull a ton of data into it. You grab all that data you have in S3 and and mess with it, and then just delete it. Psh, gone. Not the data from S3. Keep that around probably. Um, but you don't you don't have to start up Redshift in a I'm going to be committed to this for a month mentality bring it up, load up some data, do some stuff and then dump data back out of it to S3 um, and, then, and then delete it. You, you have the opportunity to play with these tools um, and you should. 
Um, hitting on efficiency again, you know, uh, as I mentioned this earlier, use explain to understand your queries and try to write fast queries. It's actually, I think, hard to learn this on small data sets because it really doesn't matter. Um, if, if you're working with thousands of rows, you know, my, my example internet question is, is kind of useless. Both of those queries are fine and honestly the same in, in you know, terms of performance. Um, so get, get big, big, big data sets and just try to transform and move them. And I, I think you'll, you'll start to see what becomes painful and that, that will start to build up your intuition. Um, and then I mentioned this in, in terms of self-sufficiency. Self um, yeah, just, just spin up databases, try them out, you know, go to, go to Google and try BigQuery and, and get on Amazon and try Redshift. Definitely don't forget to turn them off. If you, if you keep them running, they will, they will cost you. Um, but you have the opportunity to play. There's really nothing stopping you from using progression, professional grade tools with, with large data sets. All that stuff is there. You can, you can gather this experience without, you know, someone making you do it. Um, super easy. All right. So I'm going to kind of go for questions. I've got a few. Hey, uh, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, push pause on you. So, uh, cause I'm going to grab the screen. I, I, I do want to walk through the, uh, presentation about the, uh, our program, and then we'll take all the questions uh, after that. Sounds good. Okay, great. So give me one second here. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to the, uh, master of professional studies degree that we're, we put together at, uh, the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. And uh, I, I think to just start out, uh, why? Why are we putting together this, this kind of program? And I think it, it, if you look at some of the industry statistics, statistics it will almost be obvious. The, uh, the annual global entertainment revenues are predicted to increase from, from a little over $2.1 trillion in 2018 to $2.6 trillion in 2023. I think those, those numbers have even been re-evaluated over the last year. In 2018, uh, the total video game sales ex exceeded $43 billion with over 164 million adults in the United States are playing video games. So, so there's lots and lots of opportunities for video, uh, for uh, other types of entertainment businesses to try to capture your attention uh, the problem is that we, as as players or or customers, we only have a limited amount of time per day, and so it's extremely competitive. Uh, these different companies uh, I certainly want to attract your attention or customer attention, but they want to hold on to your attention too, and a lot of that has to be done using using smarter uh, tactics. And so, what we've done is we've we've crafted a program that focuses on the use of analytics in the game, entertainment, and media businesses. So this, this program is a, a professional studies uh, master's degree. It's a fully online 30 credit program. And we have experts in the industry, such as Aaron. And uh, last month, we had Solomon Foshko from Wargaming uh, to give a presentation. We have these folks as advisors who are giving us uh, insight, not only into, into what are the kinds of topics that we want to be able to cover, but what are the types of, of skills and knowledge that that individual should have if they want to be able to progress in the game and entertainment uh, analytics business. So some of the, the aspects that we look at within the program and that we've engineered into this program are, are uh, using analytics and data science for understanding customer and player behaviors, uh, understanding and improving customer or player experiences, maximizing customer lifetime value, uh, uh, using telemetry to influence and improve game topographies uh, to essentially improve uh, game design and media design uh, while all at the same time being respectful of how customers play, being able to ensure protection of private customer data, uh, maintain a, a level of data ethics uh, and make use of, of ethical approaches to using analytical uh, uh, machine learning and other types of algorithms. So what will you learn if you uh, enroll in this program? Well, it's structured to provide this holistic overview of the use of analytics in the industries. So students are going to learn about industry knowledge. And so I did note that one of the uh, one of the questions there was about about using about having knowledge of the industry there as well. 
uh, analytics, data science, life cycles, uh, being able to understand customer profile and customer analytics and how that maps into entertainment and game industries, problem solving in the context of the industries, compliance issues, especially around data privacy, especially as, as there's an increasing number of, of data privacy laws from close to 100 different countries in the world, algorithmic fairness, data ethics, and then issues associated with inclusion and equity and diversity within the game and the entertainment context. Uh, so uh, what kind of a career can you expect uh, if you were to graduate with this, this, uh, this degree? And there's what I've done here is I've got a listing of just a few types of job titles of hundreds of job listings for individuals with experience and knowledge of analytics in the game and entertainment business, uh, data analysts, game analytics, game analyst, uh, business intelligence analyst, game data scientist, uh, as well as some, some more generic roles such as technical director or live ops analytics uh, or a manager of data engineering. Uh, these are all specific titles from job listings that I've called over the last month or so directly in searching for jobs related to game or entertainment businesses uh, over the top video uh, publishers, et cetera, those types of different kinds of companies. Uh, so a little bit about the College of Information Studies, the iSchool at University of Maryland. It's uh, known as the iSchool. It's a top-ranked research and teaching college in information science. It is located just outside of Washington, D.C., for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, it is number two uh, in terms of the Master of Library Information Science program. It is the number nine Master of Science in Human-Computer Interaction. And in the uh, is ranked number three in the United States as a public university, University of Maryland. It is a, a great place with all sorts of research and uh, on data science and analytics being done uh, across a, a number of different dimensions. So if you're interested in learning more, uh, we certainly have time to answer a bunch of questions today. Uh, but we also can uh, point you to our website. It is iSchool.umd.edu slash gem. Uh, there you'll be able to to learn more about the curriculum, about the program itself, and you'll be able to, uh, to get more information if you are interested in applying for the program. And at the same time, if you have specific questions, you can email me directly, dlotion at umd.edu. Uh, I'm very uh, uh, open to answering questions that individuals have if they're interested in learning more about our GEM Analytics Master of Professional Studies. And with that, uh, I'm going to... Uh, uh, to hand this off to actually we're going to we're going to go through some of the questions so here is uh, another question what are some of the data science tools and languages that are used in the gaming industry um I, i'm not sure i know either specific to gaming i mean in general the the languages are r and python i like r because it's really nerdy um, but it's either one will allow you to marry up data with algorithms. And it's kind of about both of those languages are really about access to, to algorithm libraries. So if you want to do some clustering or in a particular style, either one of those languages will help you get your data in there. Um, on top of that, I think visualization is probably the biggest in terms of tools, you know, on, on the high end, there's, you know, Tableau, which is very good to know, um, but it's kind of expensive and heavyweight. So there's, there's lighter tools like mode analytics. Um, that are interesting as well, but any kind of visualization. That's another thing I actually like about R is I, I like the expressiveness of, of their visualization. Um, so yeah, R, Python, visualization tools. Uh, thank you. I, you know, I want to cycle back to one of the questions that, that you answered, mm -hmm. but, but I, I kind of thought it was a good question to kind of drill down into a little bit more. It was the earlier question about if you have the technical skills is yeah. gaming domain knowledge absolutely necessary? And 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 yeah. and really, I think it, the reason I, I want to cycle back on that is that one of the reasons that we we here at the iSchool wanted to put together a separate program in 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 particular with this area had to do with with context knowledge of the game industry. So could yeah, you, could you kind of no, I'm glad you brought that back up because I was I was actually thinking about amending to that. I mean, I. I definitely think that that you know other industry knowledge and, and experience is valuable, um, but it is also very valuable just to understand the context and the models that we generally use. Um, you know, I definitely am opening to hiring people who do not have game industry knowledge, but if you do, 
you, you're already past a lot of the learning that we need, just in terms of, of how we look at behaviors. And, and each gaming segment is, is kind of different. Um, you know, mobile analytics is, is fairly mature and that we really kind of, a lot of games are sort of measured the same in terms of DAU and, and LTV being the two big axes. And you know that may not be something that that you have an, a good understanding or a firm grip on. I'm sure, as someone who's been in an analysis in another industry, um, you're smart. You figure it out. But there is there is a huge value to walking in the first day and just being able to understand what the product manager is talking about. Um, one of the things that that kind of skews the industry in terms of being different in practice and in the way we model things is we're really on the entertainment side of, of how business works, um, which is very different from you know other apps or commodity sales. And so the way we talk about customers, it has got a lot of nuance. And so yes, other industry uh, experiences is very valuable and applicable. Um, but just as, just as much being able to understand the lingo and get moving and understand what people are talking about and what people traditionally mean uh, with, with certain acronyms is, is a huge value. Thanks. Actually, if you don't mind, I think I want to kind of tack onto that a little bit as mm -hmm. well, which is, which is that, that our, you know, in many industries, the, the approach to the business models are relatively static mm -hmm. in terms of we, you know, a company produces a product or a service and then markets and sells that product or service to customers and maintains that relationship to try to expand out uh, the the footprint of the products and services but in the in in what's what's kind of happened in the in the gaming industry the game industry uh and 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 Aaron, you probably know more about this than i do is this transition from the commodity approach of of purchasing uh product to the, in the free to play or the freemium model where where instead of looking at selling one item once there's there is a, a different perspective of, of continuing to add on value by providing premium services and virtual goods yep. and so that in its own right becomes somewhat complex and i think people don't really get that if you worked in in insurance or if you worked in financial services yep I think there's a lot of flux to in, in terms of where you're at in in games. You know, like I mentioned mobile is is a pretty well beaten path, and I I don't tend to be surprised when I hear about people uh, or how people are measuring their their users in a in a mobile game. That's fairly static. Um, in with Captain TV, uh, our initial customer is a streamer, and they have customers, which you know we want to be happy, but um, uh, it's it's different. Um, it's it's a different way of interacting with people, and so that's kind of another reason I mentioned. You know, not just in that gaming is new, but you know our segment of gaming is new as well. It's there are not necessarily established models at all about how how to model behaviors of streamers and, and their communities. There there may be some some older trade that we can draw from, or maybe we're just going to learn it all from scratch. Um, but you know, mobile feels to me like a very baked industry in terms of of how they do analytics. Um, even though it's not, you know, compared to, like you said, commodity business. Thanks. We had a couple of questions uh, that came in prior to the uh, to the event. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to go through some of those as well. Okay. Uh, I think you you talked you touched on this a little bit, but uh, but again, I think it, it's valuable to kind of drill down to this one as well. To what extent do game analysts need to be aware of the data architecture when writing their queries? I thought that if if the data are in the cloud, performance automatically scales. Hmm. Well, yeah, I don't know about uh, automatically scales. I I think, well, I, you know, I mentioned there's there's sort of the physical architecture of the databases that's that's important. Um, but then I think this this data pipeline that I, I was starting to paint, I think is something you really need to have a, a good a good grip on. If if you're doing a, an analysis, a lot of times you're working with with roll up tables. Um, but a lot of times you're also inventing new ones. And so, uh, you know, our example, we looked at a daily user table. So it's good if you're familiar with the daily user table and that you can draw insights and draw graphs on that. But when you're trying to ask deeper questions, then you should understand maybe you, you were the person that designed that, that roll up. Maybe you weren't, but where, what events inform that? Um, and what events could inform that? You know, the, one of the, you know, 
big things that that I think we we expect to change through the life cycle of the game is is what we track. We don't open up the game and go, yeah, we know we know what we're looking for behavior wise. We know where the inflection points are. A lot of times we just try to track a lot of different things, and and see what bubbles up. Um, but I think that's kind of a place where an analyst needs to be creative. Uh, if if the roll-up tables are there and and you're working with those, cool. But w- what's the future of those? How how is behavior changing through the game in a way that we want to model it differently? So I I feel like in in most of my experience, game analysis has has sort of evolved through the life cycle of the game, and you know the the perspective that you're trying to to gather, uh, you know, may change. Uh, you know, always you want to be looking at role of, of users, but sometimes you really just want to look at like feature interactions ir- irrelevant to the users and, and in, in re- you know, perspective of say a release or the lifespan of a feature. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think the answer is it's, it's very important because you probably should have a hand in changing the shape of it through time. Um, and the, the thought that, yeah, I mean, if you do your data in the cloud, like say you're using Snowflake, the performance can automatically scale. Um, I had a scenario where we had a tools team using Snowflake, and they were kind of they were kind of trying to use it a little too aggressively. They probably should have been looking at exports from it, but they were trying to get sort of live information from the Snowflake data. And what they were doing, because Snowflake compute instances come up and down, you know, the data stays, stays at rest. And, and when you start talking to it, the compute instances come up and they're kind of expensive. So the tools team was pinging the, uh, the Snowflake instance to keep that, that warehouse up. Um, and they made it really big so that it would be really fast. And this game wasn't even live. And I noticed after a couple of months, they had spent like $60,000 um, for a tool that didn't have any users. And so, Yes, it scaled automatically, but it was extremely expensive. Like I said, actually, uh, that kind of leads into another question that I see here because mm-hmm. you're, you're referring to uh, to Snowflake and Snowflake, I think, kind of advertises itself both as a data warehouse and, and a data mart. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the way that you kind of had described it, your your process, you were taking the data that had been streamed in and, and, and pushed into into storage and then trying to to configure that data for your types of analyses. But yeah. uh, would you would you prefer to load data into a data warehouse or or leave it in in those those files as a data mart? Which which is which do you think is preferable? I, I think it's it's got to be kind of a, a balance in the end. And and I I'm not really familiar with with formal data marts and I kind of tend to think that that's that might be a little bit of rigorous, too rigorous of a structure for what where I tend to be. Um, I want I want everything, and I, I prefer the term data lake for like S3. Like like in terms of long term, we're not going to be actively using this. Just put it in S3. If it's going to be actively used, you know, uh, then then loading things into the warehouse is is where you want to use them. Um, but I try to be in a situation where I can drop the warehouse and then revive it all from S3. Um, I, I say that. I mean, the the truth is, I re- also like to kind of keep the warehouse, you know, up and and have you know lifetime worth of data in there as I can. But as I as I want to trim down data and and delete old things or unaggregated data, um, I'm I'm comforted by the fact that it's in S3. And so I don't know if that I don't know how well that fits into the data mart. Yeah, idea. I actually think that that the question should have said data lake and not data mart. Uh, and you didn't make reference to to both of those things. So I, I think the, the question was malformed, but I think you answered it mm. the, the right way. Uh, but that you, you, what you raised also, there was a question that came in about, about uh, dura- data duration. How long, how do you decide how long to keep data? And, and you know, you would just kind of said, well, I like to have all my data sitting around. Uh, how far back into history uh, would you would you want to be able to look? The, the question actually says, do the type of yeah. analyses need to look far back into history? Yep. Um, I, I kind of have two answers for this. As a hoarder, I want all the data in the warehouse all the time. Um, there's there's something really valuable about lifetime views. I think you know even uh, in terms of you know a game studio will sit and watch its game in in charts for years. And are very familiar with their initial launch curve, and then maybe you know the lifespan after that. 
And I, I think it's real, that curve is, is essentially a, a, a totem in the culture. And it becomes easier to talk to your own people if you're saying, okay, we're here in the context of this whole journey that you remember being through. Remember when we were here? Remember when we were here? Now you kind of have some context to really size up what, what the line means for this month. Okay, so that said, you know, I, I, it's definitely more convenient to have all the data accessible all the time. There's, there's a couple of issues when it's cost. Um, you know, it's definitely easier to keep it in S3. Um, and I'll go to the next one in a minute because it's got different implications. Um, from a cost perspective, I mentioned this in the last question. You can drop stuff out of your data warehouse um, and, and um, really save a lot of time. So like on the slide where we had the incoming table, like we could drop that incoming table. We have been aggregating it. The thing that helps you produce that lifetime chart that we're all attached to is the aggregation uh, that we've been taking the whole way. So we have an aggregate view that we're going to keep forever. And then the stuff that went into that, we can probably start dropping that. Um, it's it's much less, I think it's important to see the past. The problem with that is when you want to change how you looked at the past, then you need all, all of the data to be there. The other issue, and this kind of knocks out um, the, you know, so in that, in that case, you keep it in your lake or whatever, and you can revive it if you need it. The other issue is, is sort of liability. Um, there, there are a lot of laws, like in, say, California or Belgium, that, that talk about, you know, how, how you keep data. And so um, a lot of the questions about how to deal with those regulations just become easy and go away as soon as you say, we drop all of our data every 90 days then you don't have to worry about it. If you don't drop all of your data every 90 days or whatever cycle is appropriate for the regulations you're after, and if kids are involved, it's much more intense. If you don't cycle your data out and throw it all away, um, then you need to provide mechanisms for purging it. And you may or may not know, you know what you need to purge. This, this can sometimes be a tricky thing to deal with. Making a system that purges selected data out of your data lake it's kind of painful. It's just much easier just to get rid of it. So as a hoarder, again, I want it all. Um, as a lawyer, which I'm not, I don't want any of it. I want it all gone. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective because because what you're saying is that there are different types of drivers that are determining data data duration, and that and that policies are being defined with respect to to uh, uh, keeping data or getting rid of data that have nothing to do with with the analytics or, or the business model, but rather with compliance with, with laws in different areas. Yep. Uh, I think we may have time for, uh, for one more question. Uh, to, to what ex uh, uh, when developers are building the game, do they take into account the types of anal analytics that are going to be done and develop their data models suitable for those types of uh, analytics? I think from the developer perspective, it's more about the touch points. Um, the, the entities in the game may not be the entities that, that we use on the analytics side. Um, the application database, sometimes we want information out of there. But what we really want in the analytics is, is the behavioral touch points. Um, I want, to, I want to know that something happened. I want to know that you spent something. I want to know when you spent it. And I, want to, I want to know what you, what you bought. Uh, and often the better data comes from the, the situation. And it may be data that the game itself isn't even storing. Like, you know, even in terms of like click-throughs or, or, you know, hey, did you, did you engage with the leaderboard? Did you open it up and have a look at it? I'd just like to know that you did or how often you do. Um, and that's not something that the application database or the game database is, is going to care about. So the game, the game has its models. And uh, where, I, where I like to interface with the game for analytics is telemetry events. So tell me that a thing happened, when it happened, and anything you can tell me about the situation. And so that tends to be the interface between developer and, and analyst. The analyst will be cycling back to the developer very often and going, Hey, we'd like to understand, you know, maybe there's a new feature. We need this tracking for that feature so that we can know that it's successful or not. Or maybe there's some something, you know, that we now want to track about a usual route. Okay, so they, yeah, they interacted with the leaderboard, but did, did, was it the local leaderboard or the global leaderboard? We may be wanting to add parameters. So it's those behavior touch points that I think is the interface between the two. Thanks. So Aaron, I, I want to thank you for uh, for giving us a, a sure pretty thing. thorough overview and, and perspective on, on the, 
the uh, the ability to write really efficient SQL queries, especially you know as as you you kind of uh, left it understated, but you said five hundred billion records. I mean, I think that that's not unusual, and it's probably is, is unlikely mm -hmm. to be orders of magnitude bigger when it comes to the types of of analyses that and reports that people are going to want to be able to run. So so having high performance capabilities when writing SQL is very important. So I appreciate that you took the time to share your thoughts with us today. Sure thing. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the uh, GEM program, uh, I put into the chat, a uh, you can email me directly or you can go to the schools, uh, the uh, the program's website, iSchool.umd.edu slash GEM and stay tuned, watch your emails for our next uh, iteration in the series on December 8th, we will have the next uh, webinar in the GEM Expert series uh, webinars for uh, game entertainment and media analytics. And with that, Sarah, I think uh, we're gonna be done. And again, thank you everybody for attending. I really appreciate it and I hope to hear from you.